Hola, bona tarda. Moltíssimes gràcies per venir. Avui tenim una conversa amb la Susan Orlin, la tenim aquí present. Faré la presentació en català, però després parlarem en anglès. Podeu fer servir els aparells de traducció simultània si us calen. Tot bé? Sí? La Susan Orlin és escriptora i és periodista i amb aquest llibre, La biblioteca en llames, ha estat considerat el millor llibre de no ficció dels últims 20 anys als Estats Units, que com sabeu no n'hi ha pocs. Per tant, és un llibre bastant impressionant i serà el llibre que ens servirà per conversar sobre diverses coses, sobretot al voltant de l'escriptura i de la lectura. Si després d'aquesta xerrada, que si és la meitat interessant del que és el llibre, ja us dic que ho serà molt, us interessa que us el signi, comprar-lo, etc., ho podreu fer a la porta de l'auditori. Per tant, sortiu per aquí a l'esquerra i ella hi serà i us el podrà autografiar. Així que, sense gaires més presentacions, començarem. So, thank you so much for being here. I'm thrilled to be here. And thank you all for being here. Um, and I would like to start maybe with um, some ideas about reading and writing. And I especially liked a quote in the book that goes, you read and read and read, and then what? <laughs> so, and then what, after reading so much? Uh, it's, it's a good question. And the idea that reading should lead somewhere, I think, to begin with, is um, why I love that quote. Because reading is one of those activities that doesn't need a reason. It doesn't need to lead to some goal. It in itself is justified by being uh, enriching and something that brings the world to you and it opens the world to you and it doesn't have to be purposeful. And I think it's an interesting, um, we're in a world where everything feels that it has to have a payoff. There has to be some ultimate benefit, but reading is the benefit. Reading is a way of being in the world and hearing most importantly stories and that to me is all you need to know. You hear new stories, you learn about the world around you, and that's all that you need to justify it. But at the same time, there are a lot of um, public policies directed towards making people, especially children, read more, when at least in our context, we know that children are the, the people in the population who read the most. So right. maybe we shouldn't you know, make them read so much and maybe target other uh, segments of the population, such as teenagers. We know that at, um, during uh, adolescence is when a lot of people stop reading, or uh, adults. Yeah, well, it's true that there's a huge drop off, um, particularly when people enter adolescence. And you're right, kids read a lot, and which is wonderful. But I think that you want reading to become a lifelong habit and something that you turn to for pleasure, for knowledge, to see the world in a new way. And you want to. I think it's really important to remind people of the, the incredibly transformative power of reading, that it, it only begins when you're a child. It goes from there. Um, what about writing? Does writing lead somewhere? <laughs> well, um, that's a very good question. <laughs> writing, <laughs> writing is something that... Um, well, I think for me, it always was an urgency. I just felt the need to write. And I was really drawn to writing because much as reading is transformative, to me, writing was like doing a magic trick. The idea that you could write and people could read it and have this out-of-body experience. You could describe a place that they had never been 
And by reading your description, they would feel that they were there. To me, that is this powerful, magical capacity. So from the time that I knew how to read, I wanted to write. It was, I never went through those stages of wanting to be a ballerina or an astronaut or all of the different things that kids end up wanting to be at some point in their life. I always wanted to be a writer. And I think it's because I loved reading so much. I never knew, initially I didn't know what kind of writing I wanted to do, but the simple act of looking at words on a page and having that feel like you have journeyed somewhere was so appealing to me and so seductive that I wanted to do it. Um, in the book, you explain how um, before starting writing this book, you had decided to stop writing books altogether because right. it was too painful. It was like a battle um, against this um, sometimes frustrating uh, process. Um, and then something came up. Uh, maybe we will talk about that later, of why you wrote this book. Um, and you decided, yeah, I'm going to write this. And I wanted to ask if, uh, well, first about this struggle, um, and secondly, um, if you change your mind after completing this book, if you're already writing another one, <laughs> or, or if you're just on holidays for now. Oh, I'm just on holiday for the rest of my life. <laughs> I wish. Um, you know, when I finished my last book, I, I was exhausted. It, my books involve so much research. So it's not just the writing. And in fact, I think that that's an important distinction because sometimes the writing can be really joyful. But doing the research on a big project and the amount of time it takes and the the number of dead ends that you go down and the moments when you wake up in the middle of the night and you think, I don't know what this book is about, which happens all the time. So if it's happening to you, I sympathize. Um, and the, it, just, it took so long. I mean, my last book took five years. When I finished it, I thought, I can't imagine that I'll ever come up with an idea that would make me willing to commit another five or six years. Because even though every time I start a book, I say this one's going to be short, this will <laughs> take a year, it's never happened. Um, and I don't think it ever will happen. <laughs> uh, I, I really felt I didn't want to stop being a writer. Yeah. I didn't want to get into a project that was so overwhelming and that would eat my life up for five or six years. But what happened was I stumbled across this story, and the minute I heard it, I thought, I have, I have to write a book about this. It was that immediate. And this is a, a feeling like meeting the person you fall in love with. It was just this moment of going, after well, this is my book now. I have to write this book. And there was a part of me that thought, damn it, I wasn't <laughs> going to do this. But the idea was so compelling, and it touched on so many things that I was interested in. And the story of the fire was so dramatic and, and had been overlooked so thoroughly that it, it combined all of the things that felt like a perfect story. It's not that I don't, I mean, the fact is when I'm working and I come across some wonderful piece of information, I am ecstatic. I mean, there's a lot of happiness in working. When I write a, a paragraph that I feel like I really got it right, it's a great feeling. It's just there are a lot of paragraphs in a book. <laughs> and there are a lot of days. None of my stories, none of my books have been 
obvious. None of them have been easy to explain quickly. Mm -hmm. um, or if I explain them quickly, a lot of people's reaction would be, why would you write a book about that? So a lot of my book involves arguing to a reader why I wrote a book about a fire in a library or why I wrote a book about a toothless guy who steals orchids or a dog who became a movie star. You know, they're, they're not ideas that immediately make sense. So a lot of my book is an argument to the reader. Mm -hmm. Why this is interesting, why it's important, why I felt compelled to write it. At the end of that, making that argument for five or six years, I'm, I'm convinced I can never do it again. And then, and then I do it again. <laughs> Maybe we should uh, explain a little bit about uh, the library book, because I assume that all of you knew what you were coming here for, but obviously it was for the great writer. Um, so maybe some of you don't know about the book yet. Um, so the book begins uh, telling us about a fire in the library of Los Angeles, uh, and that becomes kind of an excuse to go through all sorts of uh, people, historical faces, and, and it's actually, I think, less the story of a fire than the, the history of, of libraries in general, and, and some libraries um, in, in particular. Um, my impression while I was reading the book is that I had no idea I wanted to know all of this, but I did want to know all of this. <laughs> so is this something that, um, that you felt while you were writing? Because as you said, it takes a lot of um, uh, research uh, for you to write. And, and of course, a lot of the people you didn't know before writing the book. So right. how, how is the process in that well, way? Well, when I began the book, I had heard about this fire. This was the largest library fire in American history. And it destroyed 400,000 books, damaged 700,000 books, and was thought to be an arson set deliberately. My first thought was this book is going to be very simply the story of this fire. Well, Nothing ever seems that it makes sense without context. So I, and I knew nothing. I was new to Los Angeles. I knew nothing about the history of Los Angeles. I knew nothing about the history of this library. To be honest, I knew nothing about libraries except that I used them and loved them and was curious about why they brought out so much emotion because when I heard about this fire, I was horrified. And I thought, now that's interesting that thinking about a library burning is a horrible thought. Any building burning is something that we look at with some discomfort, but a library burning is a very emotional thing. So. I knew nothing of what I was getting into. And I, I thought, well, I'm just going to learn a little bit about the history of the library so that I know what I'm writing about. I need to know why, how this happened. And this happened in 1986. So it seemed important to know the context of 1986. But then it seemed important to know the context of 1976 in 1966, <laughs> and you know, I kept moving backward in time, and then suddenly I was in ancient Egypt. <laughs> you know, and, and that felt, because suddenly it was like, well, I wonder if any other libraries have ever burned in the course of history. Oh, oh, that library in Alexandria. Oh, you know, and it, the fact is it all led to understanding this fire and this moment in time. And it, it wasn't just sort of idle curiosity. It, it was actually meaningful in putting context to this particular fire. At the same time, I wanted to write about 
the day-to-day -day life of the library in the present. Because over the last 20 years, there's been a certain kind of um, position, which is we don't need libraries anymore. Mm -hmm. And I knew that wasn't true in my heart, but partly I wanted to write about how the library today, what's it like, how is it adapted to the way that libraries have changed. So I think of my books often starting with a very specific focus and then radiating out from that focus and putting it all in a bigger context. Mm -hmm. You were referring now to um, libraries being necessary or unnecessary. Um, I guess the, the biggest argument for libraries being necessary is, is exactly the book and, and all the facts that you, um, that you researched. Um, but also in the book we find um, the idea of libraries um, having a very strong social role other than offering books. So libraries offering refuge, physical refuge, mm -hmm. uh, and not only books as a, as a metaphorical refuge or whatever. So being um, a social center for the homeless, for example, and how they play an important role and how there are certain issues that maybe being a person who has always had a home, I, I didn't think that this was important. For example, um, rules concerning how big my backpack can be for me to get into the library, but that is very important if everything you own is in a backpack, so you need a bigger one than I would carry. Could you? Well, the, this was very interesting because inevitably the question arose, why do we need libraries? What's the point? You can find anything online. And I think as playing devil's advocate, it was important for me to raise that question, even though I didn't, in my gut, I didn't believe that we didn't need libraries. But one of the most important things about libraries and how they differ from the internet is that they are a physical place. They're a place that there are not many places that belong to us communally. You don't have to pay anything to be there. You don't, there's no requirement about doing anything when you're there as long as you behave. And that it exists as a communal space. And there are all sorts of different communities that have very few places like that, as you say, homeless people, teenagers. Um, teenagers who want to get out of the house and don't have the money to go spend to sit in a coffee shop and want to be somewhere safe and inviting and engaging. Libraries are as important to us in that same way as a public park is. I mean, you would never say, well, people have uh, their own backyard. We don't need a public park. We need public parks because it's important that we have somewhere that we can gather and that belongs to us all communally. A library is an indoor version of that. It's also a great discovery that not everything is online. There is lots and lots and lots of information and material and archival material that is not online. And I found this to be one of the most encouraging facts that I came across while I was working on this book, which is when people were surveyed about whether they believed everything was online, young people, more than older people, believe that there is a lot of material that is not online. I thought that was very encouraging. Yeah. <laughs> and all you need to do is spend a little time in the library and you'll be reminded of the fact that not everything is online. So. I think the argument that we don't need libraries has been thoroughly debunked. The fact is, in the, in the United States, and I'm not sure if it's true here, but there's no reason to think it's not true here, visits to the library have gone up. 
the number of books being taken out has leveled off or dropped a little. But to me, what that indicates is that people want a place to go. So many people now work from home and don't have an office to go to. And a library is a place to go to work where you see other human beings. That's something very worthwhile where you have a desk and you have Wi-Fi and you have the sensation of being part of society. Mm -hmm. um, here, the debate in libraries is a lot about whether they should become the social centers or they should concentrate more on literary activities. Um, and there are adamant defend defendants of both positions. Um, but I was thinking about the, the need of, of libraries existing as, as, for me, the need of a dictionary, of a, of a paper dictionary. Um, I am a translator, so I look up a lot of words on dictionaries. So when, when I am working now, I realize that I just type the word and I find the meaning for that word that I was looking for. As if I am looking for a specific book, I type the book and I find it and order specific information. But what I don't find is what I used to find when I first started studying translation studies. When I would look up a word in a, in a paper dictionary because they were not online um, yet, and I would find a lot of words that I was not actually looking up, but that would, you know, pop out and, and I would read them and learn them and, and they made set, set, um, certain connections in my brain that helped with my translation right. in some way. So it's the same when I go into a library and I'm looking for a specific book, but then to find this book, I need to go through a lot of other books that I didn't know were there and maybe I will find some that are interesting. Um, and that's also a point that you make um, in the book somehow. Well, I think that uh, there is a pleasure in being in a library and accidentally coming across books that you didn't imagine. And that's partly why I began each chapter of this book oh, yeah. with a list of other books in part um, to replicate that experience of being in a library where you go to get one book and then your eye wanders and you see a, a book you never dreamed existed or you look up in the shelf above it or below it. That is, that's part of the more enriched experience of learning, I think. I mean, you can zero in and find the specific word definition that you're looking for or the specific book. But to me, it's feeling and seeing those connections and accidentally coming across something you never dreamed existed or seeing a book that suddenly catches your attention and you lose that if you're not doing it in a library. It, it's, it's really, if you haven't been in the library in a long time, to go in and have that experience reminds you immediately of what a joy it is and how there are books that you never dreamed existed and there they are. And topics you never imagined anybody would care about and there are 50 books <laughs> on that subject. But that's what it means to, to expand your mind. I mean, finding the answer to one question is one answer. Seeing the, the breadth of curiosity and knowledge and communication is where you truly learn what what we're all thinking about and caring about and exploring and discovering. That makes me think um, of another quote of the book that I really liked. Um, maybe being a writer also, it reminded me that, yeah, it's okay, everything's okay. Um, which was, writers are sure reading their books will be important to someone. Right. So <laughs> you talk about these, um, these 50 books about one topic that you wouldn't dream that anybody was interested in, and yet there they are. So yeah. somebody thought, yeah, someone's going to care about this. I'm going to write a book about it. Well, you know, one of the most enjoyable um, things that I did while I was working on this book is I spent time in every different department of the library to try to get a sense of what it's like day to day in a big library. My favorite thing was sitting at the checkout counter 
And people would come up with a book where I couldn't believe anyone wrote that book. <laughs> but similarly, I couldn't believe anybody wanted to read that book. And then I thought, oh my God, they found each other. <laughs> it's like the two ugliest people on a dating website. <laughs> and you think, it's fantastic. It's, um, you know, the, the, the range of what we care about as a civilization is so unlimited. And the range of, of curiosity is so huge that you can't begin to imagine or narrow it down. And what I think of writing as communication. And inevitably, there is someone who wants to hear what you have to say. And I think it's really important for a writer to always keep that in mind. And the truth is that it, it is actually true that someone will want to hear that thing you want to say, even if it takes a long time <laughs> to find that one person. But it felt so hopeful and optimistic to, to see that people continue writing books and people continue reading books, that we, we continue communicating that way. And it really made me feel hopeful for, for us as a, as, as a civilization that that kind of communication continues. And it's continued, in a sense, the same way it has since the, the first time someone did a cave painting, which was someone said, I have something interesting to say. Someone else said, I want to hear it. And that's marvelous. Yeah. Um, there is a lot of, of joy in the book, despite the fire and the difficulties that you describe, um, and happiness, the happiness of books. And that's something, um, it's, it's cheating a little bit as a writer, because of course you know that people who are going to write your book are people who like reading a lot, and right. who like books a lot. So it's like, hmm, let's talk about something that we both really love. Um, but this happiness of discovering them, of buying them, uh, reading them, sharing them, remembering. And I was thinking of, of the, the feeling that I sometimes get when I buy a book that I, that I really want to read. And I buy it, I bring it home, maybe I don't start reading it immediately, maybe I'm not sure I'm going to read it in the next few weeks, but having it somehow makes me feel, okay, this knowledge, this story is here now and it's for me to read whenever I, I want to read it. Um, and this is a, a very weird feeling because you just bought a book. You, you already know nothing about it. You have not read it. You have not um, explored it yet. But somehow it has already changed you in a way. And I think that that's why books, people often ask me if I feel that we have the same attachment to ebooks that we do to physical books. And I think it is very different because you bring a book into your home, it's almost as if you've brought the writer into your home, a guest who at some point you will say, now I'm ready to hear what you have to say. It, it's a very specific feeling of access to, to that material. Um, it, I don't know that you feel quite that same sense of it with an electronic book. Uh, just to f see a book and hold it and feel it and smell it makes you feel that you are, you're connecting with it and that even if you haven't read it yet, that it's there waiting um, the guest in the corner who at some point will begin speaking. So I, I think our attachment to physical books is, that's why the idea of them burning is particularly awful, because they feel almost human. There is a way that a book contains everything human except the physical being of a human. It's the thinking and dreaming and, and information being delivered to us from another person. And that, that 
feels very intimate and very um, vital. And that's why, uh, as you and I were talking earlier, even if I have a book that I really don't like, I mean, even if it's a book I actively hate, I have trouble walking over to a wastebasket and dropping the book in. I feel like that would be awful. I mean, I'll desperately try to find somebody who wants it. <laughs> but it's, I think it's that quality of human spark in a book that makes it feel so wrong to destroy it or throw it away. That's why I, I mean, this will now sound completely contradictory, but that's why I burned a book in the course of writing this book because I was so curious about why it felt absolutely forbidden and taboo. And I had so much trouble doing it that at one point I thought, well, I'm just, I'm not gonna do this. I, it was a good idea, but Obviously, it was a bad idea <laughs> because I can't do it. And I really resisted. Um, it just felt uncomfortable, even though I could think to myself, well, I can burn this book and I can go buy another one. I haven't removed from the world something that can't be replaced. But it is against our nature to destroy a book. And, and certainly that's why you associate the destruction of books with oppressive political movements because it's a way of saying, I mean, it, it is almost like destroying humanity and it's also a way of, of erasing information and narrative from a culture that feels really violent and destructive. Mm -hmm. You talk about that also in the book, um, how there's this uh, polite way of saying someone passed away in Senegal, uh, that, that is um, uh, their library burned, and uh, how comparing books uh, to memories and, and libraries to human people. And, um, and also how some people in power have decided, some dictators have decided to erase, try to erase certain parts of history by burning books. Right. Um, but not, not only in the recent history of, of the world during the Second World War or, or whatever, but even um, from the thousands of years ago. And I think the minute people began writing books, people burned books. The minute we, burn, we built libraries, there were efforts to burn libraries. Um, it, it is also, I was thinking about this the other day, I don't think that there's any political regime that has ever burned books that didn't also try to um, kill people. It's not something that's done idly. It's something that has a lot of meaning and it's a way of saying we want to erase these ideas, erase these people. Um, certainly in World War II, there were m literally millions of books burned for that very purpose, which was to say these people don't exist. They had no, they are erased from the world's memory. And, and the people went next. And I think you would, you'll see if you look over, I mean, very interesting, one of the earliest known instances of books being burned was in China in, um, I now can't remember the year, but it was ancient 213 history. 213 before Christ, I yeah. think. <laughs> so it was a long time ago. Yeah. And what was interesting is the emperor who decided to burn the books then also buried 100 scholars alive in the library as it was burned. So he figured for he would destroy the books and then might as well destroy the writers because <laughs> that way you won't have anybody making new books. So it's always been 
we we are deeply connected to books. I happen to think that libraries, in a way, replicate the human mind. We have in our own minds these volumes and volumes of memories and. When you think about the way you remember things, it's almost as if you're pulling a book off a shelf and flipping through a memory or a piece of information or a piece of knowledge or a story that you remember. And that's why I think that expression is so, feels so accurate that mm -hmm. each person who dies takes with them their own library of of memories and knowledge. Mm -hmm. Similarly, when a library is burned, it takes down the knowledge and narratives of a culture. Um, to end with this first part, and then we will have like 10, maybe 15 minutes to take uh, questions from the audience. Um, maybe we could connect this with your mother's illness and, and the experience that you lived uh, with her and which actually pushed you um, somehow to write the book, uh, remembering, recovering these memories of you as a young girl going to the library with your mom. It very much um, was connected to this. My, my mother took me to the library all the time when I was young and it was a very special, journey that we would make together. And I hadn't thought about those um, trips together for, and for a very long time until I started working on the book. And I told my mother when I began working on the book, I said, I'm doing a book about libraries. And she said, oh, well, I think I'm the person who got you interested in libraries. And <laughs> I said, you did, absolutely. So the book was very much um, triggered by those memories. Soon after I began working on the book, my mother was diagnosed with dementia. And she began losing her memories, and it really was almost an embodiment of that expression from Senegal, as if her memories, her internal library was slowly burning down. So writing the book became very important to me as a way of capturing the memories that I had of going to the library with her so often when I was a kid and, and that I had fallen in love with what was magical about libraries through my mother. And unfortunately, my mother died before I had finished the book. And so it became even more meaningful to me to, to do what books do, which is to keep stories forever. And, and I like to think that this did. Yeah, that's beautiful. So, do you have questions? I have a lot more, if you don't, but... Okay, well, is a yeah? question over there. Hi, thanks so much for being here. Um, you mentioned earlier that you burned a book, and I wondered if you would be willing to tell us which book and why. <laughs> Read the book, girl. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> well, I'll tell you a funny story about it because I first thought. I would burn a book that I didn't like. And then I felt like that seemed really wrong to burn a book I didn't like. So I thought I'd burn a book I liked. And then I thought, well, I don't want to burn a book I liked. <laughs> so I thought, well, then maybe I'll just burn one of my books. And then I thought, well, I'm not going to burn one of my books. <laughs> That's awful. So I thought, you know what, I can't, I can't pick a book to burn. I'm not going to do this. And I told my husband, I said, I thought it was a good idea, but I can't do it. I can't bring myself to burn a book. I can't pick a book. And one day he came home and he looked really happy and he handed me a copy of Fahrenheit 451 <laughs> and said, I think I have your book for you. 
And so that's the book I burned. And all I can say is I do think Ray Bradbury would have approved. <laughs> While I was reading this part of the book, I was like, no, but don't do it. Like, you're not really going to do it, right? I'm, I really like you. You cannot burn a book. <laughs> yeah, it was, and I'm telling you, it was a really strange experience. It was something that I was very casual about it at first. I thought, oh, this will be kind of good for the book. And then I, it became very emotional. And it really felt strange. Um, I, I can't compare it to anything except maybe when you cut down a plant or you know some living thing, it really felt like I was destroying a living thing. Even though I knew perfectly well that it wasn't, it was, it was really strange. I also was afraid I'd start a forest fire. So that was... <laughs> well, you, you were it's, cautious about it. I was very cautious. Yeah, in California, you have to be very careful when you light things on fire. This is very emotional time for me because I'm French-American and I'm right now in a book and I've been collectioning books for, uh, since I was 15 in three languages, French, I'm French origin, English and Spanish. And really, I have an enormous amount but my daughter came to help me do the move because I live in a sixth floor without a lift and I'm facing a move. But she comes from Los Angeles precisely and she works in Hollywood. And I've just, she has forced me to, to really throw away at least one third of my books. And, and I just, I gonna, you know, I came up this morning with the empty shelf and I, she would not understand anything that what you're saying. Is that the case in the United States? So she's 29 now. I guess she doesn't read that many books. She's always in internet and for I think work. it's a problem with your daughter. <laughs> <laughs> no, I think that um, it's not fair to say that people of that age don't appreciate books. Um, I, I think that that's an easy assumption and I, I don't think it's true. Um, more in California? Oh my God, now I'm insulted. No. No, I don't think that's the case. I think that um, there are people in California who read. <laughs> A few. Um, and maybe you have too many books. <laughs> yeah, but I, I also think that, and this is kind of interesting, I think that Younger people are more predisposed to sharing books, much the way they're predisposed to sharing cars, to sharing workspace, that there may be this notion that you don't need to own every book you're interested in reading, and that's why libraries exist, that we share communally these books, you read it, you, have, I shouldn't say that, I make my living selling books, but I think that there is a, a kind of move away from this feeling that you need to own everything that you are interested in, and that that may end up meaning that people use libraries more frequently than buy books less automatically. And that's just, I do think that people under the age of 30 have returned to libraries with great enthusiasm. And that one of my theories is that a lot of people under the age of 30 work but don't have offices and enjoy having somewhere to go to work. But I also happen to think that there is a real appreciation for the shared aspect of the library. But tell your daughter to call me, <laughs> and, we, and we can work on this. We have other questions? Um, because there's a topic that I left out because I wanted to give room. OK, there's another question. My topic is really interesting, though. OK, <laughs> it's, it's, go ahead. It may be far better than my question. Um, 
I'm always interested in the way you begin articles and books, what the first four or five paragraphs are going to be. I used to consider it the New Yorker style because you seem to bury the lead, but it's so engaging that I'm compelled to immediately go on. Can you explain how you come up with the way you're going to open a book? Is it a choice between you and your editor, you and somebody you trust, or do you do it on your own? Um, all on my own, um, which is sometimes agony because it would be wonderful to, you know, I consider the first few paragraphs of a book to be so important that, you know, there's a lot of anxiety about getting it right. I feel like people read the first few paragraphs of a book and they decide right then and there if they're going to keep reading. So it, it feels like everything is on the line right, right away. And you either get it right and keep people reading or you lose them and you'll, you won't get them back. I, I like to lead not with what's right on the bullseye and dead on, but rather to begin somewhere somewhat obliquely that leads you to what the book is about. I like to lead with people because I think people are more interested in people than they are in places or events. And I, I want to leave you a little bit, not puzzled, but kind of curious, like, what is this, what's this about? Where is this leading? Which I think is actually kind of a delicious sensation, rather than saying, oh, this is about this. Instead, it's a feeling of, hmm, I can't quite figure out what this is about, but now I want to know, and I'm going to keep reading. I, I spend, and I write my books from the beginning through to the end, so I begin with the lead. And it is um, many, many, I, I rewrote the lead to this book a, a million times. I kept, I, I wasn't quite getting it right, and I kept going over it again and again and again. It, just to try to get every word right. I wanted it to be intriguing, a little bit mysterious, but totally addictive, so that you would say, I don't know what this is about, but I have to keep reading to figure it out. And I show all of, the, all of my work to my husband in process, and but I don't like to show it to my editor until I think it's really done. In other words, when I no longer am interested in his opinion. <laughs> <laughs> Not that he doesn't have one, but um, I feel like it, I need to really nail it down. And, and the lead really matters to me so much. I, I feel like it's, um, I don't know about if everyone reads this way, but if I'm not hooked pretty quickly, I generally, unless it's something that I am 100% convinced is going to get better, I'm, there are too many things competing for your attention, and if, it, if a lead doesn't grab you and hold you really tight, I think you're ready to give up pretty quickly. Okay, apparently we need to stop now, but I'm, I'm about to rebel because I was told we would have until 20 past seven and it's only 12 past seven. <laughs> but I will maybe point um, one of the things that we have not talked about and that is part of the marketing strategy of the book, so I think we should at least mention it, and it's uh, the crime uh, side of the book, uh, not only for the arson, but also for um, libraries being kind of um, a, a place of crime that I had never thought <laughs> that, that was possible, but apparently it is. Maybe you can comment on this very briefly before we leave. Well, the, this really did interest me to write about 
the investigation into the fire. And because it was determined early on, um, it was believed to be an arson, and someone was arrested, I wanted to know, well, whatever happened? What became of the person who was arrested, and why, why did it take the strange turns that it did? So it, and I, I wanted to use the suspense of how the story unfolded and the crime unfolded to run through the entire book because it, it was fascinating how it, it unfolded and how many different versions of what might have happened um, came into play. So I like the fact that there is a, an element of suspense in the book. Uh, I mean, it makes the, the reading of it, I think, move quickly because you are really curious about what happened in the case of this crime. And, you know, arson is a very serious crime. The amount of damage done because of this fire was in excess of $22 million. So it, it was a huge calamity. The library was closed for seven years after the fire. So it, it wasn't just that someone dropped a cigarette in a trash can and there was a little bit of a fire. It was a, a enormous and destructive event that was, whether it was indeed crime or a terrible accident, um, became part of what was interesting to me was that the crime itself had an element of suspense because it was not entirely clear mm -hmm. what had happened. Okay, so I hope we got you interested enough to run, get the book, Davant de la Porta de l'Auditori. Thank you so much for Thank the conversation. You so much. And hope to see you soon. Thank you. It's wonderful.